So welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, as Guy said, I'm Tom Goodcoop from Booz Allen, and I'll serve as the panel moderator today uh, for the next generation combat vehicle meeting the requirements and capabilities for the midterm 2030 and beyond. That's a big title for a short panel here. I think you'll find this panel uh, helpful to chart the Army's challenges on the way ahead to develop the next generation of combat vehicles. And again, we're talking 2030 and beyond, and so there's a lot of uncertainty both in, uh, in the, uh, the threat realm, science and technology, and, uh, and dollars. Uh, first, uh, General Ham and your AS, US, AUSA team, thanks for all you do for the Army. You remain the voice of the Army, uh, and this uh, great hot topic symposium today proves it. Uh, our one, recent annual meeting was done superbly, and I, I take it from my other friends that there was a, a, a big go on the RTEP uh, that you just completed, but it was a great, uh, a great annual meeting. And that was in spite of what General Sullivan had told me offline. That was. Uh, we've got an important topic this afternoon, which is critical to the preparation of execution of the development of our future Army. Given the age of our current platforms, Army forces are beginning to lose the existing overmatch against capable and elusive enemies. Reductions in resources, future worldwide threats, required capabilities, and emerging technologies will all factor into the development of our future platforms and will challenge the Army's ability to meet the nation's defense strategy in 2030 and beyond. The ongoing prioritization of current force readiness to support dynamic events in Europe, North Korea, coupled with increased deployments to the Middle East and a potential slowing of the reduction of forces from Afghanistan, has resulted in modernization and research and development funding being at historic lows uh, to the Army's top line. The Army must make hard choices given emerging, emerging technologies to support new systems and force structure opportunities to regain overmatch and be prepared to fight and win in the complex environments as outlined in the Army operating concept across all the components, active, guard, and reserve. I believe you'll hear some great ideas and perspectives from our panel today uh, based upon their extensive experience across the Army and industry. We've a uh, distinguished panel assembled here today Starting to my immediate right is our uh, panel chair, Colonel William Nichols, the uh, Director of Mounted Requirements at the Maneuver Center of Excellence. Willie has a long and distinguished career across a wide range of combat arms assignments. An armor officer, he's also served as a TRADOC Capability Manager for the Armored Brigade Combat Team, Director of the Armor School, Commander of 3rd Battalion, 81st Armor, and numerous tours in battalion and brigade units across the Army. In addition, Willie's served in combat tours in both Iraq and Afghanistan and is a graduate of the Army War College. Next is Dr. John Gordon, who joined the RAND Corporation in 1997, following a 20-year U.S. Army career and is currently a senior policy researcher. Since joining RAND, he has participated in and led numerous studies for the Office of Secretary of Defense and the Departments of the Army and the Navy. Dr. Gordon has authored or co-authored several RAND studies on counterinsurgency and irregular warfare. He has led or participated in RAND research projects for the governments of the United Kingdom, Australia, Sweden, Italy, and Germany. Dr. Gordon is also an adjunct faculty member at Georgetown and George Mason Universities, where he teaches graduate-level courses on counterinsurgency and military operations and strategy. To John's right is Mr. John Paulson, senior Director, Engineering Project Management, Management with General Dynamics Land System, where he's responsible for all engineering products, projects, logistics engineering, reliability, and test and evaluation. John retired from the Army after 20 years of active service as an Armor Officer. He served in numerous command and staff assignments and also served in several research and development and acquisition assignments in support of the Abrams tank. His final assignment in the Army was with PM Abrams, as Chief Abrams Tank Logistics and Fielding, and as the Product Manager for Abrams International Programs. Our final presenter is Dr. Brian Cheeseman, who received his PhD in me Mechanical Engineering from the University of Delaware in 1998 and joined the Army Research Lab in 2000, where he's been responsible for broad programs of theoretical 
experimental and analytical research in the areas of numerical simulation mechanics. That's funny. I used to do that too with the theoretical, mathematical. <laughs> we can talk afterwards. Uh, and materials and manufacturing science and technology for mounted and dismounted soldier protection. Dr. Cheeseman serves as a technical advisor on force protection to the laboratories, industry, program managers, U.S. allies, academia, and other government agencies. Presently, Dr. Cheeseman is leading a number of U.S. Army manufacturing technology programs that work closely with industry to increase the manufacturing readiness level of force protection technologies to enable transition within RDECOM and TACOM uh, and the vehicle OEMs and also provide TRADOC with the latest results for informing requirements. I hope you enjoy the presentations and challenge our participants with insightful questions as we continue to develop more effective capabilities to support our Army of the future. I'll now, now pass the helm to our Chair, Willie Knuckles, for his remarks. That vehicle might be um, an infantry fighting vehicle, uh, but it could also be a single combat uh, vehicle that replaces uh, the Abrams, uh, the Bradley, uh, potentially even uh, the MPF solution, and potentially even the Striker. So we, we don't know yet. It could be a family of vehicles uh, very similar to the original FCS program. Um, suffice it to say that, you know, take one look at the, at the chart behind me, and you can see this is not a short-term endeavor. This, this is a multi-decade uh, effort to get us to first unit equipped in 2035. Now, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, however you look at it, uh, what that means is the majority of the hard work that I and my team uh, and MCOE has to do it's going to have to be done before 2025 because it's going to take 10 years for, me, for industry to actually uh, build and field uh, what we want uh, for first unit equipped in 2035. Now that's given the current paradigm, uh, but that's, that's the reality that we live under right now, uh, and I can't assume that that's going to change in the next few years. So... Uh, a couple of points. Um, if, if you thought I was going to tell you what next generation combat vehicle was going to be exactly today, I'm sorry to disappoint you because we simply don't know yet. Uh, you, you can see uh, there's a solid four years of analysis that has to occur. Um, at the top column and in the bottom, you'll see simultaneously there is a, a very focused S&T effort that must occur. Because throughout the timeline that you see depicted there along the top is a series of decision points. And, and we've talked about decision points for our senior leaders today. And, and we need to provide the chief and his, his council, requirements oversight council, options for decisions. And, and those decisions are going to be uh, when do we stop improving our current capital assets uh, and put all of our effort into fielding the next generation combat vehicle, our vehicles, our families of vehicles. And we simply don't know when that's going to occur yet. But uh, as we proceed uh, to the right on this timeline, we'll know more and more and more, and we can begin to provide enough information to the senior leaders to at least start making uh, some decisions. Um, and you can see as a part of the analysis, one of the first things uh, we've got to do is provide some focus for our S&T partners. W what technologies do we want them to look at? 
Well, that requires us to do an analysis, some analysis on current technologies and where we assess them to be. Which technologies can we accelerate if we put more money into it and which ones can't, can, simply can't be accelerated and we try to make our best estimate of when that technology is gonna come aboard. So I, I can already see some of your, your the gears moving in your heads and you're like, oh no, here we go again, FCS. So uh, no, we, we've, we're we trying uh, diligently to pay attention to FCS and the lessons learned from that, which is why we're gonna have this series of decision points made in there. And so we'll make conscious decisions about what uh, NGCV will or will not be and what capabilities and technologies it will have based on our assessments of technology and where it is. So, so you can see that although we have a roadmap laid out, it is not set in stone in any way. And I would say this is more conceptual than anything. Uh, one thing I can tell you is kind of the methodology that we're using, and then, then I need to shut up and pass it to John. Um, this is going to be grounded in our best uh, projection of what the operational environment and enemy capabilities will be in 2035 uh, when looked through the, the prism of the functional concept for movement and maneuver uh, that should be completed here shortly. So those will be the kind of the foundational uh, documents and building blocks that we'll use to identify the capabilities that we require from the next generation combat vehicle. Once we understand what the capabilities are that we need and we understand um, what technologies might apply to that, we'll then be able to turn to our S&T partners and say, here's what we need you to work on um, and here's when we need it done. And so we'll give them a point in time. And then we'll continue to assess that uh, annually or more often as we proceed down the, the road to the right. Another thing you'll see I've highlighted very boldly in blue there in the middle around 21 is the industry input. I, I think we've learned a lot about the value of doing that with MPF uh, and we're going to uh, continue to do even more uh, collaboration with industry as much as possible, in fact, as we move forward. Uh, we've also developed a healthy relationship with other uh, non-governmental agencies like uh, my good friends at RAND and, and others, and so we'll continue that. Um, RAND, for example, is, is uh, just completing a independent uh, MPF analysis for us, and in fact, RAND is also doing um, some work for DA on helping make decisions, difficult decisions on Army programs and, and prioritizations. So, so those would be important. So I, I think that helps set the stage uh, for where we're trying to go in the Army. And uh, Dr. Gordon is gonna talk about what we think the enemy uh, might look like in 2035. John. Okay, thank you very much, Colonel Knuckles. And I think uh, I'm, the few minutes I'm, I have, I'm gonna try to stress some of the threats that the Army's gonna have to take into consideration uh, as it thinks about the current family of vehicles and how they're gonna evolve over the next you know, couple of decades as well as the new vehicles which will follow those that Colonel Knuckles uh, alluded to. You know, that they are, They're still very much at the conceptual stage. Um, you've heard a number of people mention today that the pacing threat the Army is um, really putting a lot of emphasis right now is on the Russians. And, and I think the Chinese could also be a, a very close second on that. I think throughout the most of the Cold War, we devoted a lot of attention to, you know, what are the highest end threats? If we can manage those or mitigate those or cope with those, will be good for most other operations, you know, sort of at a lower level of intensity. That, you know, that, that may or may not be true, but I think that, that um, uh, you know, even though we might not fight the Russians any time in the foreseeable future, we certainly have a, uh, probably a greater chance that we're gonna be engaging people uh, with their systems. And so on the, uh, could you go ahead and put my, my first slide up of two? So I'll give you some examples of some of the, the key threats that the Army is going to have to consider. Some of these are extrapolations of current weapons that you all are very familiar with. There may be some new things, and I hope to give um, to raise a few eyebrows here with some of the things I'm going to suggest are going to be worthy of consideration. So the um, uh, the most likely opponents we're probably going to have are 
middle level state opponents um, or, and, and, and uh, hybrid opponents, non-state actors like ISIS, and both of those, of course, can have some state-of-the-art weapon systems. Um, you know, they can have a mixture of older and new systems. You know, it can include things, you know, absolutely state-of-the-art. The most common threats to Army vehicles today and in the foreseeable future, I think into this, you know, as we're planning what the next ser series of vehicles uh, probably has to look like and the threats that you want to, you know, prepare those vehicles to deal with, um, are the ones on the top row on this slide. The RPG, uh, ATGM, IED slash mine threats. Um, these things are ubiquitous. Uh, Non-state actors are heavily armed with these systems as well as state level opponents. Um, and in particular, just a couple of key points on these, in the shape charge weapons that you see up there, the RPG and the ATGM weapons, the penetrating power of these weapons in the last 10 or 15 years has increased dramatically. Uh, you've seen no, not only the penetrating power of the base weapon itself, and you can look at the numbers up there, but now they're also being equipped with tandem warheads to, um, to deal with things like explosive reactive armor. So you can see penetration numbers up there where it says after ERA, so AT, modern ATGMs can go through a meter of armor plate after they blast through an explosive reactive armor array. That's pretty difficult to cope with. And I would say that weapon system in the center top, the, the uh, ATGMs, more than anything else, that's what's driving us in the direction of active protection systems. Uh, the mine and ID is ubiquitous. It's not new. Uh, Mr. Sando and I were chatting uh, during lunch, and I mentioned how even during World War II, the Army lost a lot of vehicles to mines, both in the, in the European and Pacific theater. So uh, vehicle designers today are having to take those into consideration, and I think a key driver of weight is going to be how much protection do you want from the mine and IED threat? You know, how much risk are you willing to accept? How much protection are you going to, or do you want to have? Um, th then you can't forget the kinetic energy threat, and that's really what the, the ar enemy armored vehicles you know, bring to the table, both whether it's uh, infantry fighting vehicles on the left or, or tanks on the right. They're armed with, uh, with powerful weapons. The, um, uh, uh, the growth in the power, the penetrating power of, of uh, medium caliber auto cannons is also very, very impressive. And whereas an, a an APS is hopefully going to seriously degrade the threat that you, f you face from things like RPGs and um, ATGMs, um, the, the ability of an APS to deal with a string of slugs coming in from an enemy autocannon that can go through an awful lot of armor, you know, that's, it's going to be problematic whether APS is going to be able to deal with that. Uh, but the, the KE threat is now mostly in armored vehicles, um, and if, to, to the extent there's good news, that a lot of the uh, non-state opponents have limited numbers of those. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, there's a couple things on here. The, um, uh, the artillery threat, you know, it was already mentioned earlier how a lot of Ukrainian soldiers and vehicles were knocked out and killed by the multiple rocket launchers that the Russians use. A couple of key points about those. Um, one, the ranges are increasing dramatically. Second, the warhead varieties are going up uh, significantly, things like thermal barrack and especially top attack munitions, including top attack precision munitions. And that's probably going to be the big changes that we see into this era of the 2030s that Colonel Knuckles is talking about. Um, cyber threats. Uh, we have a lot of discussion about that, great discussion that immediately preceded this panel about how do you operate in a degraded environment because the cyber attacks uh, you know, can, can significantly degrade your systems. Uh, I would offer perhaps this is a, uh, something for consideration as we move more and more in the direction of unmanned systems, are they particularly vulnerable to cyber threats? How do they degrade? How do unmanned systems degrade when you're in a, in a, in a uh, serious EW and cyber environment? And the last threat uh, that I'd like to just call your attention to, um, that is, yes, indeed, that's a mushroom cloud on the slide. Um, I think the unfortunate reality is that as we consider 
the middle tier opponents, the hostile regional adversaries of this era that we're talking about, uh, we can't ignore the possibility that nuclear weapons can be used. It was mentioned earlier today that the Russians talk a lot, they do, oh, you read their doctrine, a lot of it's in English, about the use of tactical nuclear weapons. In, in bygone years, in Cold War, we used to pay a tax, quote unquote, on a lot of our comm systems in particular to harden them against nuclear EMP. We haven't done that in a while. So when we start talking about designing vehicles for future threats of the 2030s and beyond, I think this is an area where we at least have to think more about it than we have in the last couple of decades since the Cold War ended. And with that, Colonel Knuckles, over to you, sir. All right. <clears throat> well, thanks for the opportunity to be on this panel, and I'd like to discuss renewable power plant technology today. So I'll get right into it. There are five major renewable energy sources that are out there, wind, geothermal, biomass, solar, and hydroelectric. Wind, geothermal, and for the most part solar, really aren't practical in a combat vehicle role. So today I'd like to discuss biomass and types of electrical power sources. I'm going to briefly discuss several promising technologies, but I want to state up front that until these technologies are more mature, that is, similar swap C as current subsystems, they may have to supplant other capabilities. And while some of these technologies are available today, they come with other considerations. These will require a very rigorous systems engineering approach to get to the best solution. So first of all, I'll talk about biofuels. They present an opportunity to provide cheaper, more readily available fuel options. DARPA has a project to develop JP8 through algae or cellulosic approaches that has been reasonably successful. The intent would be to use as drop-in fuels to integrate into existing tanks of JP8. This works to keep class three supply costs down, thus reducing overall ONS costs, but does not reduce the logistics footprint. We're still, we'll, we'll still gonna need 5,000 gallon tanks to deliver fuel. For electric power, there's fuel cell, hybrid electric, and full electric technology. First, I'd like to talk fuel cells. Fuel cell technology provides some great possibilities for renewable energy in combat vehicles. Hydrogen fuel cells can be relatively dense in the power to swap C ratio. In the reclamation piece, getting hydrogen from fossil fuel, that adds additional size and weight. The process also degrades with dirty fuel. Current challenge to work is that hydrogen fuel cells need to be about two to three times the size of current diesel fuel tanks in order to provide the same cruising range. There are no near-term advantages in efficiency as a military fuel, especially to propel a 35-ton or greater vehicle. So weight and size are current challenges that need to be worked. However, fuel cell technology is available now to operate vehicles while stationary or for unlimited silent watch. Battelle has developed a system which can take hydrocarbon fuel, even the dirtiest JP8 variety, and convert it to hydrogen to produce electricity. Fuel cells, coupled with other technology, like high capacity batteries, may be able to supply steady state as well as instantaneous power required for systems like active protective systems, high intensity lasers, and next generation situational awareness components. Hybrid electric drives or pure electric drives appear to be the most promising renewable energy source right now. With hybrid electric drives, we can repurpose the regenerator power from braking, particularly from in-hub drives, and even turret electric drives to store energy until it's needed. Electric energy generated from braking can be stored in battery and capacitor systems instead of being lost to heat. The recovered energy can be used to supplement engine power, reducing fuel consumption and the associated logistics trail. The same theory works for traversing hilly terrain by regenerating power downhill for utilization uphill. That technology is also available today. Hybrid electric drives would seriously decrease the quantity of JP that's needed to be brought forward in the combat trains, but doesn't eliminate it. A combination of hydro, hybrid electric drives plus other technology can add additional improvements to the fuel savings. Electric turbo compound is an add-on that can be used in conjunction with hybrid electric drives to use energy created by the vehicle engine. It recovers engine waste energy from the exhaust without additional cooling burden. This technology is currently being used in Formula One racing cars with success, and several manufacturers like Caterpillar and John Deere have successfully investigated systems for off-road vehicles in the past five to 10 years. Two types of this system are being developed. One is a simple add-on device after the turbocharger, which generates electricity from the expanding exhaust gas after the turbocharger. The second is a more complex turbocharger, which has an electric motor or generator 
integrated into the turbocharger, which can generate the same electric power as the first, but it can also eliminate turbo lag or even improve engine low speed performance as a supercharger. Either device should reduce fuel consumption by five to 10%. Current cost estimates for mature systems about 40 to $50 per horsepower recuperated. Waste energy heat is another add-on that provides benefit to fuel savings. Powertrain efficiencies, particularly engine power plants, result in significant power loss to heat, which is removed from the vehicle via exhaust and the thermal management system. There's potential for recouping some of these losses through waste heat recovery and converting heat loss to electrical energy. This would both have an energy efficient benefit for the platform and provide electrical energy that could be used or stored for various future needs. Recovering loss to heat may not be limited to, uh, just to the powertrain. High power consumers like lasers and other directed energy systems may also have the potential to be exploited. Additional downstream benefits can be realized as the proof of loss heat can potentially manage signature as well. There's also energy savings to be gained thinking about vehicle idle operation. Up to 80% of vehicle operation time is at engine idle. Hybrid systems util utilizing high energy batteries enabling cycling of the engine between on off conditions will reduce fuel consumption and the associated logistics footprint. Initial calculations show about a 25% fuel savings. That technology is also available today. Full vehicle electrification could definitely change the way we fuel combat vehicles. It would result in a complete elimination of engines and fuel systems for a fully electric vehicle, similar to the Tesla design. Recharge stations, solar power, and or quick battery changes would provide energy for the next mission and reduce the logistics trail. The result is quiet operation all the time. Full electrification requires advances in energy storage technologies, both battery and capacitor for heavy vehicle applications. Pure E-drives could eliminate the need for JP-8 if we can figure out a way to provide mobile energy recharging stations to the battlefield or figure out a way that is both cost efficient and transportation volume efficient to provide swap out batteries to combat vehicles like Tesla is, pro is proposing for their electric cars. The big advantage with electric drives is we'll be able to supply more power to combat vehicles to support future weapons like high intensity lasers, rail guns, or after protective systems and improve situational awareness electronics. So to sum all this up, the underlying issue with all this is that fossil fuel is by far the most energy dense fuel that is practical for the application of propelling military vehicles. What we need to do as a science and technology industry government team is to get together to determine how best we go about the investments for the future. On all these potential improvements, there are a billion trades to be made. As wheels, hubs, and batteries become heavier, the powertrain and fuel get lighter. The overall solution needs to be close to the same weight or better. Similarly, if we reclaim energy, we can potentially free up weight to add additional capability. A clean sheet approach will likely be needed. Other considerations as we explore these possibilities are, what's the impact of developing new technology versus the cost of current diesel fuel? What's the impact to Army logistics when we provide renewable energy log packs plus maintain legacy fleet vehicle log packs? Are we creating more of a burden on the logistics system and is it worth it? What positive or negative impacts are there on vehicle size and weight for renewable energy power plants versus improved conventional power plants? We just need to consider all these things. Whichever way do we decide to go, there are some pretty, uh, real challenges ahead and we need to tackle those to, uh, real, uh, and fig need, we need to figure it out pretty soon. Together we have the capability to make this happen, but if an FUE for the next gen combat vehicle is expected in 2035, given our current acquisition cycles, we probably need to have the technology somewhat mature about 2025. That's only eight years away. So thanks, and I appreciate the chance to discuss this with you. Brian, please. Thank you. So if you want to pull up my first slide, I'm just going to reiterate what uh, Mr. Paulson just said. If we look at Colonel Knuckles' slide, as far as where we're going to be with the next generation combat vehicle in 2035, we back up the timeline, one to two years for full first unit equipped, uh, one to two years full rate production, uh, milestone C and the EMDs roughly around 2030. You back that up another two to three years, we're at 2027, 2025. So we have to work on the S&T challenges over the next eight to 10 years, meaning the programs that we have currently running now, plus probably the next couple of POM cycles that we go are going to dictate the direction forward for the next generation combat vehicle. So uh, some of the important considerations and some of the lessons learned, I know people have been discussing SCS today, have, have also been discussing GCV, but 
I came aboard the Army Research Lab when FCS was, was running. I was working the composite armor piece for the heavy machine gun, right? But some of the uh, other technologies being worked were some uh, encapsulated te technologies for the lower, lower glacis of FCS, and that was a very high, efficient armor system to be applied to a very finite footprint on that vehicle. Okay, so when they started looking at, at GCV and saying, hey, we want that level of protection 360, okay. What they didn't realize, though, is that very refined armor package was $12,000 a square foot. So that equate, you equate the cost to a, a bigger vehicle with more surface area, it was $22 million was the price tag. So uh, I've had the very good fortune of working with TRADOC for the past, very closely for the past six to seven years, and, and the lieutenant colonel there said, well, cheese, because everybody calls me cheese, right? I don't know why. But when we peeled the general off of the ceiling after we gave him the price tag, okay, you know, he pretty much beat into us the, the value, the, the, the cost value of the equation here, right? So that was a, that was a, a good lesson learned as we, as we lean forward. So if we start looking at the critical technologies that have been outlined for, for the next gen combat vehicle by MCOE. So if you want to pull up slide two real quick. Also, if you want to jiggle the, uh, the, the thing on the upper right-hand corner, I'll let that video play as I talk, if, if that's possible. Yeah, so uh, ju just as an aside, everybody's been talking about UAS and the application of UAS in the Ukraine to call in fires. This is a video from a UAS out of Syria. So it's, it's, it's a pretty good one because it's actually rocket artillery. You can see the launch, the flight, and the impact on target. And, you know, it's all from one system, but I digress. Uh, looking at the critical enabling technologies, power and energy, Mr. Paulson covered uh, very well uh, a certain suite of that. Vehicle protection, VPS, uh, lightweight materials, and directed energy. Uh, one of the things we can do, and, and RDECOM and industry have, have been currently working a, a lot of issues looking at the future, uh, and there's a lot to be harnessed in the current set of programs that are currently running that are ending in FY19 at a maturity level of technical TRL-6, okay? So if we look at, like, the technologies getting worked out of CVP uh, to include the next-gen engine, uh, the advanced transmission, I know Tardex working very closely with SAPA on a very high efficiency transmission, 92% efficient. That's similar to the transmission that was featured in the next-gen Bradley at AUSA. Uh, that offers a quite a lot of potential. That should be mature uh, from, from Tardex program in FY19. Uh, there's advanced APUs, high capacity track. Uh, external suspension was also mentioned earlier as by uh, General McMaster as a, another potential enabling technology specifically for force protection from underbody blast. So there's a lot of external suspension, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but there's a number of them, uh, manufacturers out there. Some of them are getting looked at at TARDEC. I know BAE is looking at, looking at some of that also. Uh, I'd be remiss in, in leaving out the Israelis. Uh, the system they field on both the, oh, the Merkava 2, 3, 4, and the Mare is an external system, but it's interesting in the fact it's a hydromechanical, not a hydro pneumatic or hydro pneumatic suspension unit. So it's complete, it springs in a, in, a, in a dash pot, more or less. Very easy to fix and feel from a BDR perspective when you take a mine strike, okay? But a lot of technology is getting worked out of there, getting, getting fielded, in, or not fielded, but uh, transitioned to TRL-6 in, in FY19 from lethality. Uh, the counter UAS mission I know has been discussed earlier. Uh, you know, where that is going to be organically in the units, that, that's still being discussed, but uh, I know ARDEC's been working the, the, uh, the 50 millimeter Bushmaster looking at that in a counter UAV role. That also is coming to fruition in FY19. So these are some of the technologies that, that are currently getting worked that could be considered for the NGCV. So next. Some of the other technologies, VPS, APS has been discussed throughout the day. Uh, I think everybody realizes the capabilities that, that that can bring to the fight as far as mitigation of some of the RPG or ATGM threats that are out there. Uh, we're taking the lessons learned that, that we've, we've seen that from Israel, especially with Operation Protective Edge and the success they had there. It's great to see that moving forward in an expedited fashion. Uh, the results of the expedited effort will be you know, should be done at the end of the year. Uh, TARDEX MAPS program has significant benefit, uh, not, not just from the expedited, but the, the current program itself, billing itself as the modular ATS, 
I think is, a, is an important fact because if you start looking at for first unit equipped in 2035, and we're talking about technologies that were taken to TRL 6 10 years previous, right? There's a lot of, you know, progress in technology within 10 years. To be able to pull that advances in specifically, if we, if we start talking about the sensors, and build that and bake that into the systems as we think about it going forward, that I think that's absolutely critical, absolutely critical. So looking at that, uh, advances in lightweight materials. There's been uh, a number of efforts ongoing the past few years. Uh, speaking to the underbody threat, that's that's something I've been working closely. Uh, TRADOC was key in get, getting that accelerated, putting the, putting the boot in our butts from the S&T side to say, get this done, we need the data. Okay, uh, from a Mantec perspective, we we work closely with uh, Alcoa to forge a single piece hull. We also work closely with Constellium to form single piece hulls and BAE who brought some uh, IRAD advanced welding techniques uh, where we've taken these hulls, uh, shot them at both a threshold and objective levels and showed that from a manufacturing perspective and also from a cost perspective that this technology is there, right? It's there. You can, you can from an underbody perspective, we can say that, hey, we can mitigate a large portion of the threats that are, that are out there. So, I mean, that, that was a, a key takeaway from that. Uh, of course, it comes at a weight penalty. It'll probably come at a cost penalty, but th those are the trades that need to be established. Uh, composite materials, there's composite armors, advanced composite armors that are getting worked right now. They, they, are, they should be TRL-6 within the next 18 months or so, okay? And looking forward, uh, you know, it's not just looking at composites or even aluminums. There's, there's lightweight steels that are, are bubbling up. Okay, so there's one called Feminol. It's, it offers 10% weight savings compared to RHA, and if you can do a one-to-one -one swap on a thickness level, then you can say you can potentially save 10% uh, right then and there. So, but there needs to be some maturation, uh, and from a cost perspective, it's also very attractive. But that that that's getting off the ground as we speak. Uh, directed energy, I think, from a force protection standpoint, is an area that the S&T community is lacking. Okay. Uh, Bringing, bringing directed energy to the battlefield in, in a weaponized form, you see, the, you see that train coming. There's no question about it. As the power sources become smaller, as, as the capabilities of the lasers become more prevalent, uh, yeah, you, you can see that emerging. Uh, but on the, when you're on the receiving end, uh, that's where we need to have some effort focused. No question about it. But to, just to, to conclude the talk, and this kind of echoes what was on the first slide, is that, you know, Looking at the S&T, it's essential, I think, from the get-go to frame the S&T efforts. I mean, if we, if we understand what the approximate cost per unit of an NGCV is going to be and then figure out how that's broken out and say, okay, for the hull and armor, this is how much it needs to cost, that can really hone in what the S&T efforts are going to focus on. You know, the scientists, they like looking at the shiny baubles and chasing that 75% that, uh, reduction. Those are high risk. Right. There's a high risk and typically high cost. So if we can if we can focus those efforts initially out of the gate, I think we can have some pretty pretty fruitful S and T harvest coming up. So thank you. Thanks, Brian. Hey Brian, can you go back to your first uh, chart? Sure. Real quick? I'd like you to highlight one one thing that's very important. Can, can you elaborate you touched on it <coughs> about the difference between TRL and MRL and the significance and how it's related to the Right, so TRL, so TRL like six is when a, a system or subsystem has been, and I'll, I'll relate, it, relate it back to the uh, armor component, has been through thermal cycling, shake, rattle, and roll. It's been shot under all the different environmental conditions. It is more or less ready to be transitioned to the system level, okay? When you have an MRL level six to complement that, that basically is telling you that the manufacturing base is there to support the component level build, okay, almost a prototype build. That does not necessarily mean that that manufacturing process can scale to, to deliver the amount of components needed for full rate production, right? We, we have a, a manufacturing process that we can we can build these, these assemblies at the rate of 
a few a week maybe, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we, we can churn out multiple square feet of armor, you know, at a, at a high volume rate. So in, maturing the MRL is absolutely critical and also to drive down the cost. So going from MRL 6 to 7, 7, you're focusing on cost reduction. You're also for focusing on alternate sources, domestic production, things of that nature. So, I mean, that, that's, that's absolutely critical. Sure. Okay, we've got a series of good questions here from the audience. Uh, the first one, kind of looking through a, the lens of now through 2035, says, can the M1 and Bradley stay competitive versus threat and execute Army CONOPS through 2035? Willie, your thoughts? Yeah, so through to through 2035. Right. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, I mean, if you look at um, the, the ECPs that we have planned for, for both the Abrams and Bradley, um, I think clearly um, our ABCTs will be competitive. Now, uh, that doesn't necessarily imply, nor I mean, do I mean to say that uh, all of our armor brigade combat teams might uh, be brought up to that standard or that level. It might be a select number of ABCTs. So that decision has not yet been made. Uh, but with the planned improvements we have for our Abrams and our Bradleys and the current improvements to the PIM, the addition of the AMP V, uh, then yes, I, I clearly believe that our ABCTs uh, will be competitive. Uh, Dr. Gordon, what capabilities will be required for a combat vehicle operating in a contested, non-conventional environment, for example, chem-bio threats or others? Yeah, I think uh, similar to the nuclear issue that I raised, we, we can't ignore this. And, you know, the unfortunate reality, someone earlier um, mentioned it today, that chemical weapons, you know, have been used. Um, they haven't been used against us. That could change very well in the future. So I think um, that particularly as we start thinking about what the future vehicles, uh, the kind of threats we want the future vehicles to be able to cope with, um, that is yet another one. And as you know, I suggested, the you know, at least hardening the vehicle's electronics against some degree of electromagnetic pulse from nuclear weapon use uh, will probably be very judicious for us to do that. Same thing with chem bio. I think we probably need to consider the extent to which individual vehicles, which we probably can be operating in a much more dispersed manner on future battlefields compared to today. So that may drive you in the direction of individual vehicles needing detection systems and certainly overpressure and filtration systems. Uh, things that we haven't really thought very much about since the end of the Cold War. Dr. Cheeseman, uh, what's the status of the research and development efforts in nanotechnology that enables lighter armored vehicles with greater protection? Are the Army laboratories giving this appropriate emphasis? Yeah, there's a lot of efforts right now on going on nanotechnologies. Uh, those specific to, to armor, I, I would still consider those 6-1, basic, basic research. Uh, transitioning those to early 6-2, we can't exactly say what benefit or how much weight that can potentially save. I've heard people say, well, you know, perhaps 20 to 30 percent, but, you know, it, it's hard to project at that, at that maturity level how that's going to play out. But, yeah, there, there are ongoing efforts in, in the nano, especially when you start, I mean, if you, if you break it out into the nanograin ceramics and, and nano additions to composites and, and nanograin metals, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different things that are going on, but it's, it's a TBD as to what percent weight reduction it, it's going to uh, provide. Thank you. I'm going to open this one up to the panel. Uh, and as we've looked at different uh, slides today, lots of different required capabilities, uh, lots of priorities within the Army. Uh, you know, you go through every system and there's all the required capabilities that have come up with. And at some point in time, my question really is, can we execute with the dollars available 
all of these s and t priorities or do we need to tighten the shot group and look at some key ones where you can really get the bang for the buck and so given the tremendous number of required capabilities across the force have we properly integrated and focused the s and t community in action to actually provide the future capabilities needed I'll go first, guys. I, I think the answer to the very last part of your question is, have we properly focused s and community up to this point? Uh, my opinion is clearly not. And so that, that uh, if you go back to the chart I showed and the guidance I've received from General Wesley, that is clearly our initial focus. It's to, to gain an understanding of where we stand with science and technology and where we need to focus s and for purpose and time. And then those are the technologies that we need to put emphasis and resources towards. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Um, yeah, I don't think we can do it all. I think we definitely need to focus. I mean, there's a lot of different technologies out there. We've got to choose which ones are the best ones, which ones will give us the best warfighting capability. And I, I believe it's, uh, government and industry, as, you know, as we talked about in, in a lot of the presentations, they collaborate together you know, and then pool our IRAD, I think we can, I think we can actually come up with the right solution. No, I think that's a, that's a great st statement and the fact that it, it's, it's a collaborative environment and it has to be. Uh, the funding, funding levels being what they are, if we can pool the IRAD, pool the s and and, and have it very, very focused, uh, it, you can get a lot done in a very short period of time with the right focus, no question. Okay, uh, here's another one. Lasers were not mentioned, yet they offer potential in communications, weaponization, and uh, locating threats. Any comments about uh, emerging laser capabilities that could be integrated into these uh, weapon systems? Yeah, uh, from, from a weapons perspective, you know, there's no question that they can be integrated in, and by 2035, I fully expect to see lasers on the battlefield. There's, there's, there's absolutely no question. Uh, you know, if you look at what's going on in SMDC, Strategic Missile Defense Command, and, and, and the work they're doing in, in CRAM, shrinking that down is, is the next step. Shrinking that down is happening. I mean, there's, there's IRAD efforts that are ongoing in industry looking at it right now. Uh, from a lab perspective, uh, we've, been, we've been fiscally constrained, but, uh, you know, we're, we're looking, we're definitely looking to pursue it. As, as I mentioned earlier, from a force protection perspective, I think we're lacking. I think we need, we need a, we need the S&T focus in that lane. I think part of the threat array that we're gonna have to cope with in the future is a, a growing amount of ISR that our opponents are gonna have. I mean, we've already, today it was mentioned by a couple of different people about the proliferation of UAVs, the number of UAVs the Russians are using, for example. Chinese are actually out, out ahead of the Russians as far as the quantity and variety of UAVs they use. And so we can't ha get ourselves in a situation where our formations and small units are being overflown by um, a cheap, unmanned aerial systems. Even they have them, no weapons on them. They may be just be looking for us. That's, that's bad enough. So we can't be in a situation where we're having to shoot expensive munitions about what, what could be large numbers of UAVs. And I think personally that's an area where lasers, now how many vehicles needed, you know, within a company or the, within a battalion or brigade, that, that's, a, that's a question that would merit study. But I think using laser technology to take out the kind of systems that will be trying to overfly our units may be a, a good thing that we should consider. Yeah, I'd just like to add that, you know, as we can generate more power on the combat vehicles themselves, I mean, we've had some pretty good successes with low power lasers right now. And so I, I think if we, can, if we can get to the point where we can generate more power on, on our vehicles with some of the things that I talked about, you know, in my presentation, I think we definitely have the possibility of using higher power lasers and making it viable. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, the vehicle protective suite, ICD, that uh, is fixing to go through staffing and DA includes um, counter UAS and, and CRAM uh, capabilities, which is most likely going to be satisfied with lasers. I, I, I agree with Brian and the other guys. Um, and we've already seen lasers uh, demonstrated, um, 
think on the striker uh, in a counter UAS role. And so I, I think in, in the next few years, I think it's very, very likely that we see a, a laser used in a counter UAS role um, on a striker. What, um, what I struggle with is how do I integrate that same capability in an IBCT? Uh, so what do I take off uh, of whatever platform? And same with the ABCT. So do I remove a tow system? Do I remove something else? So we have significant um, swap seat issues there. Um, and you've already heard General Lundy talk about um, no, no growth uh, in force structure. Uh, so adding a, a different, uh, a, a new vehicle, a new people uh, is going to be challenging. So uh, it's a lot more to uh, the problem and the challenge than simply coming up with the technological solution. It's how do we employ it. Um, but I think I agree with LeBron again. I think certainly uh, next generation combat vehicle, you'll see that, and it will likely be an integrated solution uh, in the combat vehicle. Just as an aside, uh, going back more years than I like to recall, I had two laser equipped Bradleys in Task Force 21. And from a policy perspective, the question then was, it was kind of thrown out today in terms of sighting systems. What you're really talking about is melting the eyeballs of the crews that get hit by the laser as opposed to killing the vehicle. And I don't know what our current policies are in that regard. Yeah, so we can kill you, but we can't blind you. Okay. Next question. Uh, for the industry, how can industry help the Army in getting uh, innovative material solutions at a quicker pace to meet the timelines of the next generation combat vehicle program. Willie, thoughts? How can industry help the Army in speeding up the, the vehicle timelines for production and? Well, I, I think one way clearly is through uh, collaboratively uh, developing um, prototypes, subsystem prototypes, uh, tech demonstrators, and I, and I think we're headed down that path. There's been a lot of talk about prototypes, and, and uh, unfortunately we've got to clean up our language because prototypes means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, but I think uh, one way that we're going to approach NGCV uh, is, is through uh, at least a tech demonstrator, if not a series of tech demonstrators. So uh, we go back to IRAD, investment of IRAD, and how they can help accelerate uh, the timelines. I, I clearly think that that is one area that they could help, um, along with the multiple areas that the Army could do a better job to help. John, any thoughts from industry? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, again, the, the theme is collaboration, but as industry and, and government talk, and we discussed requirements together and, and you know as General Lundy said you know we talk operational versus technical requirements you know we can focus on a handful of uh, requirements where the Ar Army tells us hey this is how we want to fight the vehicle and if it's a handful then we can have less performance uh, uh, performance specifications driven up by the PM and if we have less of those then you can really unleash industry to do things a whole lot quicker because right now we try to put a whole bunch of stuff in this box that you've, you know, you've, you've given us a whole bunch of stuff to put in the box. If you give us the box and if with a few requirements and say, okay, go do it, I think you'll find from all the industry competitors, I think you can find some really innovative solutions. So I think that, and, and I think you'll find things will go a lot faster as well. Um, as an example, um, if we're just using uh, metrics to develop a system, we may miss some of the things that you can see. But if I can let you under the tent and uh, you understand the nuances how, of how we intend to fight it, and we are collaborating and communicating on a regular basis, you can see something that I would otherwise not see because you're seeing the science and you can see how it would apply to the nuance of how we're fighting. So maintaining that communication, but also you, industry, 
seeking working to understand the operational environment is fundamental to that so it takes a little extra work on both our parts okay uh, dr. Cheeseman uh, are there efforts underway to develop pre detonation capabilities for IEDs and mines using directed energy or other sources that could reduce the need for underbelly protection and John when, when he's done if you have something John Paulson if you want to pipe in also please do yeah, I'm, I'm not the expert on the left of boom, but I know there's been significant efforts looking at the utilization of energy to pre-detonate. I mean, I think there were a couple of systems that were fielded into Iraq uh, with the REF and JIDO looking at exactly that, right? But, uh, you know, I haven't seen much as, as far as that transitioning. You know, it's, it's, it, when you talk to the, to the detect guys, it's not, you know, detecting IEDs and, and mines, they can do it. It's doing it at the, the, the speed that's going to be required for uh, move, movement and maneuver. I mean, you know, you're basically constrained even with the level of, of technology we have today at roughly, what, five miles per hour, you know, and, and that's, that's where we are, you know. So it doesn't directly answer the question, but, you know, you, I still think you're going to need, you're, you're going to need armor between the, the soldier and the threat at the end of the day. It's going to come down to that. Yeah, Tom, could, could you just repeat the question one more time? I just want to make sure. <clears throat> Given changes, I'm sorry. Uh, are there efforts underway to develop pre-detonation capabilities for IEDs and mines using directed energy or other sources that could reduce the need for as much underbelly protection? Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm not aware of any, so I'd, I, I couldn't say yes or no. So uh, Dr. Gordon, given changes in the field artillery and, and rocket capabilities, how does vehicle design need to change to meet the emerging threats? Yeah, I think that's one of the realities in this era that we're talking about here. You know, the, the, there's always been a top attack threat to armored vehicles. Again, you can go back to World War II. Tanks were being knocked out by random mortar rounds and artillery rounds that would strike the top of the vehicle. It's been happening, you know, for a long time. Um, I think what's changing is that the, the the lethality of the top attack munitions is increasing. Um, there are going to be more of them, and as I mentioned, uh, for artillery systems, you're going to see a, a as the years go by more and more uh, precision top attack. Uh, weapons. Uh, how many of you all are familiar with SATARM that the U.S. Army tried to develop? Some, and it worked. It worked. Several hundred rounds were developed. They worked very well. And then the program was canceled due to cost. Well, other militaries around the world are developing systems like that. Um, I think, uh, and by the way, just do, do, it isn't part of artillery, but I think another trend that's going on that's related to the protecting the tops of the vehicles is um, uh, in the, the ATGM world, as the years go by, more and more ATGMs aren't going to be coming in horizontally against the vehicle. They're also going to be coming down from the top. So I think you can have artillery problem and you can have ATGM top attack protection problem. Uh, I think that as the um, maps and other uh, 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 efforts are made to develop active protection systems uh, to mitigate a whole variety of threats. I think what this, this indicates is that you're going to have to go for, he for hemispheric coverage. I mean, you're going you're to have to have upward-looking APS systems. They're going to be able to detect and engage you know, as high a fraction of these weapons as you possibly can. The, the difficulty with thing like a SAT arm is that you've got to intercept the submunition before it fires. Because, you know, an ATGM, I mean, if you're really lucky, here comes the diving missile at 300 meters a second or whatever, and you kill it just before it gets to the top of your vehicle, you may be okay. With a thing like a sat arm slug, which is like an explosively forming, forming projectile, you got to kill it before it fires. Because once the, the submunition fires and that slug is heading toward your vehicle top at 5,000 feet per second, it's a pretty tough target to deal with. But I think the, the idea of having APSs that are going to be going, uh, looking all, at all aspects of the vehicle, including straight up, is going to be required. Can I just ask a sure. 
the one we really need to be focused on is top attack because top attack is targeted, whereas underbelly is not. Um, and, and underbelly is not a new threat. We've been dealing with, with mines forever. And how do we deal with mines? We maneuver. The reason I think we're consumed with it right now is because we got hammered by it for the last 15 years, but that's not because maneuver didn't work. It was because we were in a different environment. So for designing a vehicle to fight, my sense is that if you're going to assume risk, you, you assume risk on underbelly and mitigate it with maneuver. And as you evolve into a new environment, wide area security, you might have some modular underbelly yeah. solution. But that, that's important for industry to think through, and I'd, I want to know what your thoughts are on that. Okay, so from the underbody perspective, you know, when we started doing the, the Mantech effort, we looked, the first thing we looked at was integrated large X protection, right, large underbody protection. We got done the first test, basically came off the test pad, it was like, okay, you need threshold kit to objective. So we completely changed the tact, and that's, that's the way we went. So what was done is, is the, the hulls that were the manufactured, we could, we, you, can, you can absorb that threshold hit. No question about it, okay? Is it, and if I give you a number, right, if I give you a number, I can say you can do, if you are 25% thicker than where AMPV is right now, okay, you can get to where you guys wanted to get to, plus or minus, okay? That's not completely vetted, but it's close. So it's a slight weight increase, but what, what you find out is that when you have a thin-walled vehicle like a striker, right, or if, if you look at 113, it was an inch and an eighth, an inch and an eighth of 5083 on your belly. If you look at Bradley, what was Bradley? Same thing, inch and an eighth. So the lessons learned in Vietnam were not translated into the into the Bradley. You look at Sheridan, one inch. That was that was Sheridan, right? Sheridan was one inch, okay? And if you look at the requirement package that they put together for those airborne vehicles in the early 60s, what did they give up? <coughs> they gave up AT mines. They said, we'll do AP mines, but we can't do AT mines. But what you also trade off there is that it's very, very difficult to kit a very thin plate like that. You cannot get a very high level of protection because your base level of protection there is so thin. But if you got some meat there, you can go big. I can tell you that right now. You can go big. I, and I, I, I would highly recommend building that in from zero, right? There's going to be a penalty, I understand. But if we go back and look through history, and, 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 you know, coming out of World War II, what do we see? We lost significant percentages due to mines. And I can tell you, coming out of World War II, what did they do with the S&T budget? They turned it off, with the exception of two areas. One was shape charges, and one was mines. There was a substantial amount of S&T going into mines, okay? They did a tremendous amount of work, okay? And that dictated what our current belly plates of the current platforms are today. Abrams is that thick because of that effort. Okay, so when we went into Korea, what did we learn? We still had a problem, right? We go into Vietnam, what do we do? Well, we took our newest vehicles, the airborne vehicles, we stuck them into Nam, and what happened? We got hammered. We got hammered. And what did we learn coming out of that? Nothing, right? And, and, and you know, you, you look at it, and, and we have an opportunity, and, and, you know, I look at that opportunity. The opportunity is we can take that bar and we can move it so far to the, to the right these jokers can't plan enough because we're going to find them. We're going to see them do it, you know. So I, I'm obviously very passionate about that, right. But going back to the top attack, agreed. Top attack, no, no question about it. But when you're up there and you, you're, those things are spinning with the millimeter wave sensors, right, if we know they're up there and they're spinning with those sensors, what are we going to do? Pop obscurant. If we can pop obscurant and, and block their vision and block that sensor, okay, that's another effective means to try to mitigate that threat. So, and I'll get, on a, I'll get on the soapbox for my boys down at ECBC, how much work have we done in smoke in the past 20 years? Not much, right? And that's something I think that, is it low-hanging fruit? I think that is low-hanging fruit, no question about it. You know, turn them on, and they'll, they'll, get, you that cap they'll get you that capability quickly. So. Okay, I don't know if, uh, if Bob Lennox is still in the audience, but here's a uh, Interesting question. We've heard a lot of desires and new technologies today, but as seen on the Abrams dieselization effort, many advanced capabilities get removed when funding prioritization happens in the G8. How secure, how secure is the Army's money being allocated for the next generation combat vehicle? I'll open it up. 
to anyone. Well, the, So, yeah, there isn't any um, to speak of. So I, I, I was going to close with this um, at the end, but this is probably a good time to talk about it. So the, the greatest um, progress, or, or rather change, since we refined our, our campaign plan this year is frankly on NGCV. Or if you look at all the portfolios within CDID, I think NGCV is the most changed in the last several months. So how do we get there? First of all, um, Willie talked about redefining what NGCV is. Originally, it was FFV, something that would follow the Bradley. And the reason we pulled away from that is because not only was the Lira and our Palm approach um, consistent with the way human behavior, that is, we tend to do things repetitively over and over. We've got an FFE, we'll have an FFE forever. And so we wanted to stretch people's thinking to move beyond just a fighting vehicle. What's the next generation? means of conveyance that I used earlier to maneuver with. So it's, it's a forcing function, first of all. But the other thing that we thought through is we looked at the, the maturity of the Bradley and the tank and where it was going and the expectation that we're going through the middle of the century. We knew as we did some backwards planning, we'd have to be fielding a 35. And to be fielding in 35, we need to have some decisions by a 25, 26, which means we're late to need right now. So then we went and looked at our combat vehicle modernization strategy, which you've all seen, and, and, and although a good document to describe the platforms we need in the future, what it was missing was a plan or an actual strategy to get to 2050 with a new fielded vehicle. That is concerning to us, and so what we appealed to the three-star GOSC when we did our quarterly um, vehicle platform summit in Detroit was to let the Maneuver Center of Excellence take the combat vehicle modernization strategy, define an azimuth to get to an end state with decision points along that pathway, with decision space for the chief, which then would drive us to what type of S&T investment we need to make in order to get to those decision points. So whereas FFV has lines in the Lyra um, right now, ultimately we want to evolve that to the next generation combat vehicle determined by potential trades and decisions on ECPs that we have scheduled for the Bradleys and the tanks. So what we owe the, both industry, also the Army, is that azimuth I'm talking about with decision points and trade space in order to get after that. We will ultimately probably trade away ECPs at some point, either in volume or in, in function, in order to increasingly put S&T in a focused manner towards mature technologies.